All right, we got the screen. We got that ugly, the ugly infinity screen. And I'm gonna clear this out. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the, now the neuroimaging in Python tutorial. Uh, we are going to be leveraging what uh, was covered in the yesterday's tutorial for Docker and Singularity, but we're not going to explicitly cover some of the, the details and implementation of how Docker and Singularity work. We're going to be using that as a vehicle for learning uh, neuroimaging in Python. So with that said, I'm going to navigate. I'm going to close this. I'm going to navigate to the uh, GitHub repository that I am actually using for this um, for this tutorial. And I think I linked it in the uh, yeah. So I'm using uh, Michael Nodder's work, which uh, he's another person that is fairly prolific in his uh, ability to make tutorials and write in um, and write good good Python code and he has uh, and he has been very very gracious in sharing a lot of his material that he has created this is something from his Cambridge tutorial so we'll be um, leveraging this tutorial just some parts of it but you'll be able to uh, go through the other portions of the tutorial at your own time since we'll have uh, you'll have the the docker image working and you'll be able to run all the code in the other notebooks as well but we're just going to cover the data manipulation notebooks today and that is um, we will I will cover uh, any questions that you have that are perhaps not directly related to this since some of the notebooks will cover uh, more um, of the introduction to Python and Jupyter, which is not uh, what we're going to be covering today. We're going to be covering more just sort of a couple packages that we use in Python to manipulate neuroimaging data. Uh, but if you do have any questions about um, basic or not more fundamental concepts of Python or how do we use a Jupyter Notebook, I'll try to um, hint those as we go along. But if you have additional questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, so this is what he did um, last year. I guess in September last year, so it's almost a year. And I am assuming that we already have Docker installed, which is what we walked through. Um, and then with everyone that's here, this command should work. And if you already have the Docker container uh, available locally on your machine, or the Docker image, I should say, available locally on your machine, then you should be able to copy and paste that URL. And we will get rid of this, uh, this hash, is what we would call it, as well as the parentheses in order to get to the URL that we want. It's valid. And then that will navigate us here. All right. So with that set up, we'll go to um, workshop, notebooks, and the first thing that we'll click on is image manipulation nibabble. All right, I'm just going to leave that set up for uh, one second while I talk a little bit, <laughs> but we'll we'll get in the hands-on activities really soon. So. When deciding what to cover for this tutorial, I was thinking about uh, covering NiPipe as well, but when uh, I was thinking about NiPipe uh, versus, say, NiBabel and NiLearn, NiPipe at a at a high level, I would say, is a way of um, to say the same type of thing. It's a way of like scaling up uh, like a process that you already have. Uh, and it makes it easier to uh, run things in parallel and make it so that you have better uh, logging and better recording of the of the commands that you do run. 
So Nightpipe is great for creating a, a workflow of something that you already understand. So I'm taking a step back and not talking about how do we make a good workflow from things that we already stand to uh, just trying to understand what those components would be in our workflow. Um, so Nightpipe is a, a great thing to learn once you're trying to really solidify your, your workflow or your pipeline, but just to even know what kinds of things could go in our pipeline, uh, that deserves a nice conversation as well. So we're going to take a step back and look at um, how do we load in data, uh, neuroimaging data into Python, and how do we, what are some of the utility functions that we can use to do some um, basic visualization and basic, um, and some other, I need to try to stop saying basic, fundamental, uh, some fundamental operations on the neuroimaging data and for visualization and for uh, processing. So with that, that is, um, <clears throat> we can split up NiBabel and NiLearn into kind of two camps where NiBabel is mostly focused on uh, loading and saving and just working with the neuroimaging files themselves. And NiLearn is um, kind of built on top of another Python package called scikit-learn, which uh, in the scientific, in the Python scientific world, scikit-learn is the de facto uh, standard package for doing machine learning at type of applications uh, generally. So NiLearn is, um, you can think of it as being built on top of scikit-learn in order to provide additional um, machine learning capabilities or make it a little bit easier to do uh, different types of machine learning applications on neuroimaging data and things that aren't machine learning. I use NiLearn for uh, straight up uh, creating correlation matrices of just what's the signal in one region to another. So things don't need to be uh, machine machine learning for, for NiLearn. Yeah, and then if you use these together, you can do uh, a lot of different things. Yeah. And that was pretty much the introduction. So yeah, I said I wasn't going to talk for very long. <laughs> uh, at least I'm still going to talk, but now we can actually have a notebook to go along with it. I made the same mistake yesterday saying I was going to stop talking, but I'm not. So what we have here for Nye Babel is a short introduction of getting comfortable with uh, loading and saving neuroimaging data that we could load into Python. And now I haven't personally worked with uh, a lot of the, or some of the data types that they have listed here, but I will take the, the Nye Babel developments team word for it that it can load uh, nifty files, SPM analyze, uh, FreeSurfer, the parrec uh, files, and Siemens ECAD and DICOMs. So those are, that covers a wide variety of different uh, imaging types that we, or how the data can be saved in nifty form, or not in nifty format, but in, uh, to store an imaging data. The most popular one is the, the nifty format. So that is the, the most common file type extension that you'll see in um, that contain your imaging data. <laughs> and we'll cover some of those. And now to run a cell in Jupyter, you can hit shift enter. And you'll see the little asterisk there saying that it is running. And if it doesn't return an error and gives you a number output, then uh, which is what should be the case, since we all have the exact same machine uh, running, then we'll have it be successful. And what we're doing here is in Python, uh, I guess I'll just contrast it to R, since that is what uh, some other people might have more experience with. Um, Instead of, this is analogous to the, to the library function, except um, we still need to reference where the, 
the functions are coming from in Python. So in R, if I do like library, uh, library LME, and then all the functions that came from LME are now accessible to, or LME4, are now uh, accessible to me if I just type in, say, like LM. I don't need to type in um, the analogous way of doing this in R would be LME4 colon colon then name of the function. Um, so in Python, all we do, or what we do, um, is we import the, the package either plainly or uh, we can, uh, let me create a, if I click on the, the blue box out here and I hit the, the, the key B on my keyboard, then it will create a, a new cell below that one. And if I do A, which stands for above, it'll create one above. So what I'm just going to do here is I'm going to hit, uh, now to access anything from NiBabel, uh, since I imported NiBabel as NB, I can now hit uh, NB, period. And then if I hit tab, it'll show all the functions that I have uh, available from the NiBabel, uh, all the functions or attributes that I have available from the, from the NiBabel package. How do you run the code? Uh, that the uh, to run the code it was shift enter. And then yeah, I like to use this um, the tab autocomplete a lot is really helpful. And then um, if I select a function uh, to call a function, this is true in uh, R as well. You'll have the parens to pass in arguments to uh, a function. And instead of doing the, the question mark name of the function in order to get the help information in R, uh, what we do with Jupyter Notebooks is that you hit shift tab. And then you can keep hitting that to get like more detailed information. So if I do it, uh, so if I do it once, gives me basic information about what are the arguments that this function takes. If I do it twice, it gives me uh, more of the description of what the function is. And I think if I do it, oh, that didn't seem to work. I tried to do it three times. Let's see if I try to do it three times again. One, two, three, four. All right, yeah, and then if I do it four times, um, it'll pull up a window on the, the bottom here so I can uh, look at the documentation while uh, scrolling through the actual code as well. So this will be, um, this is what, what I turn to a lot uh, for when I'm trying to remember exactly what a function takes or what I'm trying to remember, what thing do I need um, using shift tab, um, using shift tab to figure out what arguments a function takes, and then, or shift, yeah, shift tab to figure out what arguments something takes, and uh, when I am not even sure what function I want, but I might have an idea, or I would recognize it once I see it, then just hitting uh, period, then tab um, gives me uh, all the available functions that are uh, accessible at this point. Okay. Then you can hit uh, D twice to delete a box in case you're done working with it. D, D. And that... Uh, and that is different, and you have to be uh, selected out here. So if I hit DD while my cursor is activated, it's just going to write two Ds. Um, so yeah. All right. Now, the, with that brief. Yeah, to get the. Yeah. So I hit NB dot nifty header. So now if I hit shift. Shift tab. Yeah. So shift tab once, twice. 
I guess I'm not quite sure what three times does. Oh, it will linger for 10 seconds while you type. Oh, okay, cool. So, I do, whoop. If I click down here and hit it twice, but then I start typing, it disappears. But if I hit it three times, then if I start typing, it stays there. <laughs> and then if I hit it four times, then it is a permanent screen on the, the bottom. So as you can have different levels of, either you can say intrusiveness or helpfulness, depending on how you view the, uh, the help information. Okay. So to load in uh, a file that is uh, the neuroimaging data, it's as um, they made it a uh, relatively simple command you call nb, which is the nibabel package, period load, and that's the function. And then the argument it takes is the, is the path to the neuroimaging file. And just to give us an intuition of what that, um, that that file exists in a location, if you're slightly comfortable um, with the terminal, I can cd into data and see that this uh, that directory exists on the the container that I'm in, and if I look up this entire file and list the contents, then if it if it didn't exist, it would give me something like that where it said it didn't exist. So. This file exists, it exists on a, a system somewhere. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Um, so I just look back into my terminal and it's like auto saving the notebook that we're in right now, but then it says notebook workshop slash notebook slash image manipulation nibabble.ipynb is not trusted. Yeah, that's a, um, I guess the, the short answer is that I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, it has to deal, um, you know what, I'm not even, I'm not even aware enough to give you like an intelligent answer <laughs> okay. of, of why that's the case. I know that if you hit this button right here, uh, I would say oh, wow. by default, um, I guess things running through the browser, your browser tries to limit the functionality of oh, okay. like what's running so through it. it. So it's trying to protect your, the computer. yeah. So it's trying to protect your computer because there might be malicious code on here. I mean, there's not, <laughs> but I'm saying just like visiting random websites like could have malicious code in the, in the browser. Um, so that's so like it, it, by, it by default it, trusted. what's up? So it's safer to just keep a notebook in not trusted state. It uh, if, if you believe that there's, if somebody's being malicious, but well, for, for, for safety purposes, yeah, for safety purposes, but, uh, I think for certain functionality, you'll want to have it trusted, uh, so just for like interactive. Book, then... Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I think you'd be, you could be inclined to, uh, trust yourself. <laughs> and I think... I might be wrong here, but since we're running this through a container, I don't know if it can actually impact your like actual host machine um, through this browser connection. Like even if there was malicious code, I think it would just impact the the container, which you can just shut down and then it's like nothing happened. Okay. Uh, that is what people. As like a little side note, that's what people do to, uh, I guess, like troll other people that try to access your personal information, that they spin up a virtual box and then they uh, call in a scam help center and then they uh, usually do something malicious to them. But it's since they're completely safe, since with their virtual box, they can just shut it down and they don't actually have access. The hackers don't actually have access to anything or the scammers don't have access to anything. But uh, that was just a little side note. But I think that we're safe <laughs> is the, the short bit. Yeah. I have a question. So uh, why when I like uh, open in the Jupyter, uh, the like uh, total data, I do not see the, uh, the PS. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, so the, the difference here uh, is that the Jupyter Notebook is, is starting in a certain directory. Uh, so there's another... So there's another directory that's called data that's on the, so it's just a different directory. Yeah, sorry, that's so, probably not too helpful. So we will not know, like, a, they just give the link to the data. We do not know, like, a, where the data located or... Uh, uh, we can, uh, since we have access to the terminal here, we can uh, find where uh, everything is. So if I was to look for, uh, I wonder where that is. So if I go into the the home directory, then I can go into workshop, notebooks, and there's another data directory here. And that's what uh, we have access to in the Jupyter Notebook. But there's also another data directory in the uh, at the root level, which is a different, it's just a folder that's the same name in a different location. Yeah. And then, Jatin, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm just trying to remind myself. Yeah. Kind of so, we downloaded Docker. Mm -hmm. And currently, does Docker have anything incorporated with it as far as imaging programs, or is it just the, the nine Babel and nine learn? How did we connect with it? Yeah, so the, so the question is, uh, is how is, how is Docker connected to these uh, other pieces of software that we have installed and how we're accessing it? Um, so it all comes packaged within the, the Docker image when you hit that Docker run command with the, the Michael forward slash, uh, what was it, Cambridge underscore 2018. That referenced uh, a Docker image, which is just like a big blob of data that contains the computational environment and software environment. And uh, so it has all the packages installed on it. And then you just download, then it downloads that for you, and then runs the, the Jupyter Notebook through that container such that you can, uh, with, the, with that dash P, that quadruple eight, colon quadruple eight, that opens up the portal between the container and your local computer to uh, access that Jupyter notebook through the terminal. So then we have uh, we now have like a nice visual interface to look at what's inside this container with a with a Jupyter notebook and where all the software is installed on that container. So the big benefit is that we don't need to worry about uh, configuring things. I mean, you need to worry about it once. Once you to configure it the first time, but you don't have to worry about it at all if somebody else has already done it for you, uh, and you'll just have to worry about it once if you need to configure it yourself. And then once you configure it once yourself, then you can ship it to everyone else, and then everyone else will be able to have the exact same setup that you do, without having to like try to set up someone else from scratch again and make sure that they have the the same versions of everything. So we ran uh, this load command, and uh, it saved the results of this load command to this image variable. And we can look at the, oop, I guess I didn't run it. There we go. And we can look at the results of the, the image command, or the image variable inside uh, this output file. So since this was a, a nifty file, it loaded it as a nifty image, uh, which is one of the NiBabel representations. So it will show you some of the same metadata and header information that's inside the, the image, or that's inside the nifty file itself. And we'll have access to uh, this information via the, this image variable. All right, so pretty much this contains all of the all the data that we would want to uh, ever have access to from the from the nifty file itself. And this is going to be like our primary uh, our, our primary object that we work with. Okay. 
But the most useful thing probably is the actual data from the image. So not just the, the header information, but the actual, uh, the actual uh, what we say, voxels and what's inside, what's the value inside each, uh, in each voxel represented either as a, uh, a three-dimensional matrix, if it's just one volume, or as a, in this case, uh, a four-dimensional matrix because it's a uh, since it's fMRI data that has multiple volumes over time. So we have uh, voxels in uh, what we'd call i, j, and i, j, and k instead of x, y, and z since uh, uh, eh, I'm going to gloss over that. <laughs> But there's a lot of conversation about like how do we represent the position of the head in um, like scanner space versus and like as we load into a matrix like the head we could have it uh, the head be straight up it could be facing forward it could be upside down uh, so there's a different ways to relate the the these simple numbers that we see here to the actual head position but I'm gonna gloss over that for now. And the other thing that we care about is that there's 184 volumes is how we can interpret that uh, fourth number. We can see that there's a, uh, the affine transformation, which is, um, again, kind of related to the thing that I'm, that I'm glossing over right now, uh, how we translate from voxel, inf how we translate from the... Uh, from the this four-dimensional array to some type of physical space uh, representation. So right now we just have numbers in uh, in a list for that uh, for the data. But when we actually collected the data, the voxels had a particular size, whether it be two millimeters by two millimeters by two millimeters, or uh, have other properties uh, such as that. This. Uh, this allows us to uh, kind of transform between those uh, representations. And I might cover that a little bit later, but um, I'm going to gloss over that for, for right now, since that, uh, that deserves a, another discussion on its own. <laughs> and then we have uh, pixel dimensions, which uh, give us a more I guess, solid representation of, say, for this image, we have four by four by almost four millimeter voxels uh, with a time of repetition, which means that uh, from collecting from one volume to the next, so moving from say 183 to 184, it takes uh, 2.5 seconds. Okay. And then they talk about uh, yeah some of the optimization of loading loading a bunch of data and RAM can be uh, intensive. So NiBabel does some nice things for you in order to try to uh, reduce the memory footprint of loading all these large data sets on your uh, on your system. <laughs> and each of the each of the voxels can be, well, the data within the image are going to be a certain data type. So such that they can be floats, which takes up a, a lot of memory. They could be uh, integers, uh, which take up uh, fewer, which takes up fewer bits of memory. Uh, and so again, that's just about uh, optimization of how much of a memory footprint the the data is going to have on our computer as we try to as we try to process it. In this case, uh, I'm going to say integer, but uh, I'm actually not as familiar as I maybe should be about all the the different representations of uh, of integers that we can have. Like there's little endian and big endian, and I should have. Now looking back, I probably should have reviewed on what those are. <laughs> but I'll just say that there's different there's different value representations. Okay. So another useful function in um, 
what we have here is that we're actually using uh, matplotlib, which uh, is one of the fundamental packages for creating images and, and creating visualizations in Python. And uh, we're using the data variable, which was defined up here to be the, uh, the actual working data from the image. And we are looking at the uh, all of the all of the I's and all of the J's. So that means uh, we're picking out a particular uh, slice uh, by showing that we want this to be uh, somewhere in the the middle of the brain, and then we're selecting the the first the very first volume. Since Python is zero indexed, the the first number is a uh, the first, the first number in any array is always going to be zero. And we can look at this little command here just to get an intuition of what that, that one's doing. So we have data shape, which returns uh, what we, if we remember from up here, it returns us the, the shape of the image. And we want to access the the index 2, which is going to be 0, 1, 2. So it's actually going to be the, the third number in there. And then uh, if we want to go halfway, if we just do one division sign, that will return a float, which is not what we want. So in order to coerce it to be, because uh, we can't, and we don't like floats because uh, we can't use a, uh, a float to get an index. Because if I try to do that, then that won't work. So this is saying, I want to access the array at 2.0, but we can't access a, a float uh, at a particular index. It has to be an integer. So if we want to divide this by 2 and have an integer output, we have to do the double divide. And that will return an integer for us. Uh, then this provides a, this will return the same thing if I just type in 15 right here. But it's just more generalizable in case we wanted to load other types of data uh, to have this general equation in here, since now we could load like other other images and it would give us the 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 middle portion of it, whether that be fifteen or not. Okay. So <clears throat> we want to load the T one data from subject one and to plot the image using the same volume indexing as before. Also print the, the shape of the data. So um, with this, we'd have to know where the uh, where the data was. Which I guess if we knew about uh, if we know about bids, then we should know the the general naming structure for the image. So if I was to type this out. It would, well, I'm not going to type it out. Do you guys want to work on the solution, or should I just uh, move along? Do you guys have an opinion? I think you can just move along. Just move along, yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, this is the this is the same idea, where we load the data, we uh, get the data, and then we use the matplot, uh, the matplotlib, to show um, to actually display the the data for us. So it does look like it's a uh, the field of view is probably different since this slice looks different from what this slice. This slice looks a lot more uh, ventral than this than this slice is. So that's probably because the tops and bottoms. Uh, are cut off at different points for the actual uh, for the actual matrix. All right, and now, in addition to using matplotlib as a as a viewer, the image file itself has its own uh, has its own viewer. So when we load something in Nibabel, it has its own. Uh, when we load an image, it has its own interactive viewer that we can use. If 
did I type it in wrong? I bought live notebook. And this did work when I clicked on it last time. <laughs> but the ideal would be, uh, I wonder why it's doing that. I wonder if I ran something. And kernel, we start it. And if something weird happens, um, what I, is this is good to cover too. Uh, we have the, the kernel tab here in which you can restart or interrupt or what I'm gonna do is uh, restart and clear output. So that's going to uh, pretty much give me a clean slate to run the, run the commands again to get to that point. Then we'll see if that one works. That is still not okay. Do, 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 do. Okay, I guess I don't know why that's not working right now, even though it worked like a, it worked on yours. Cleanup takes one. Did I add something? Well, maybe I. I accidentally changed something in the in the code here at some point. But for some reason, it's not working for me. But if it works for other people, then that's good. Anyways, you'll be able to click around and you'll be able to uh, see the image. So it's like a like a viewer if you use FSL or something like that. It did. It gave it gave you the same thing that it gave me. All right, I'll have to look into that because it it did work once for me and then it didn't work. So it seems like a yeah, a little bit of a strange behavior there. So I'll skim over that for now, but um, I can come back to it to give it a little bit of a deeper uh, deeper look. And here is where he goes in, or where we have the. Uh, the affine matrix, which allows us to uh, transform between the, uh, say, the IJK, which is the just the the numerical representations of each of each voxel, but without knowing anything about the size or uh, the location of those voxels, and the affine helps. Um, translate that to an actual physical space so that we can see where the brain actually is in space and be able to relate it to something that actually exists in space. So axis orientation. So yeah, so it can also tell us uh, what the orientation of the image was. And that was when I was hinting at when I was, uh, when I was talking about whether the head should be straight up, face forward, or uh, in any other types of orientation. So Nibabel gives a, a representation of how the, uh, or Nibabel gives you access to how the image should be represented. If it's represented incorrectly in the nifty file, it's probably gonna be represented incorrectly in the, in the in Nibabel. So it doesn't give a correction. Uh, it just reports what was in the, the nifty file. And here we can also see the the voxel sizes. It looks like there's there might be a little bit of a, a rounding error depending on the the function that you call, but it's about uh, four by four by four. <laughs> oh, these are all the same. Okay. The axes, yeah. Let's see. That will give me the same error. Okay. See, I'm not sure why this is giving me an error right now, but it works for some people. So well, now it's not working. Now it's not working. So cleanup takes one positional argument. All right. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to Google that later <laughs> to figure out like why that's happening. So now we can move into the just looking at the header information of the. Uh, of the T1 file, which is the structural image. 
and yeah, we can get all the different s all the different metadata that's stored with the the nifty file using nibabel. Um, then a little additional treat that you get when you install nibabel is you get a command line utility that you can use in your shell. And that's what the exclamation mark means here. It means run this command in the uh, in a terminal or like interpret this command to be ran on the terminal. So that should give the same output as I ran if I was to run it on here. So you can get some basic information just working on the terminal so you don't have to like pull up, uh, you don't even have to pull up a uh, Python to uh, get some information about a file. And it just returns the general shape, the voxel dimensions, and the, uh, the, the repetition time. <laughs> and you can look at particular um, pieces of the, of the of the metadata if you request it from uh, nib.ls. Then finally, uh, I think that's finally, yes, uh, we'll cover uh, how do you can actually create a new uh, new nifty data frame. So after you do some type of manipulation to the data, which now that we have this, uh, when you load it in, the you basically have access to, well, you do have access to uh, a bunch of numbers, either in a three-dimensional or four-dimensional array. And um, the number of packages in Python that can handle those, uh, that can handle that type of data is uh, numerous. So you can do lots of different types of uh, uh, of analyses and manipulations using just what you have uh, access to as a, as a piece of matrix, as just working with a, a matrix of numbers, uh, which we'll cover in the, the nylon really quick. <laughs> I guess we, we might not get into uh, it as much as I wanted to. But here we uh, rescale the data by uh, Looking, do, 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 do. yeah, so we're forcing the data between 0 and 255, and we're changing the data type to uh, an 8 bit integer. So this is the rescaling command, or this is how, what he, um, what the code is to rescale it. And if we look at um, what rescaled is, rescaled is uh, now just another matrix that should be a four-dimensional matrix. It's the same shape as our original image. We just uh, change the values within that uh, within that matrix. So now we can save that as a um, as a new image with this um, nibabel nifty one image function, and then we pass in the data. We can use the same uh, same affine since we didn't actually uh, like change the position of the of the of the voxels or of the data. We just change the values at their respective locations, and we can also pass in the uh, well. We can pass in the same header information, and then with the nb save, this creates a uh, an object that's a it's like a nifty image that's loaded into RAM. And then the nibabel save actually saves that object onto a location on your uh, hard drive or disk. So we can see uh, that the data type for the new image is the uh, the eight-bit integer, and then this was the other type of integer that I can't remember the name of. All right, and we can see that the uh, Turn by the header, yeah. And we can see the, what are we doing here? That the the size of the, the rescaled image is only 12, uh, 12 megabytes as opposed to the, the other integer type, which I guess took up, takes up twice as much data. And what we're doing here is, uh, Saving, mm. okay, yeah, yeah. 
I guess I don't know why we set the data type for the image object. I feel like that we should have set the data uh, data D type for the new image object. But anyways, what we're doing here is that we're uh, fixing the header information because the header information still said it was with that other type of integer. Do, 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 do. Anyways, okay. And I guess if you save the header information with the, with the correct integer, uh, then the image gets even smaller. All right. So now we're going to switch gears to the do, 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 really quickly. Or where was that? It wasn't in data. It was in the nylon. Okay, so we've we covered what we can do with nybabel and load in data and manipulate data that uh, um, in the neuroimaging format. But now nylon is going to be much more about uh, manipulation and visualization of that data. So we can import uh, different aspects from from nylon. This at this point we're just importing the plotting functions from. From Nylearn, so uh, and uh, here we're we're uh, importing some of the uh, some of the image functions that we can pull from Nylearn. So like loading the image and getting the image into uh, again getting the image into Python, and all this is doing, even though we're calling this through Nylearn. Uh, <laughs> Nylearn under the hood is uh, calling Nybabel. So Nylearn is leveraging Nybabel to uh, do all this functionality. So it's not re re implemented uh, as like a totally, we, did, we haven't reinvented the wheel. We just gave it a different name. Okay. Uh, then here is a, uh, a nice way of just cutting off the first five volumes of an image just by giving the index. Uh, if we want all of the, uh, the IJK, so we want the entire volume, but uh, we only want volumes from five, word, five on. Do, do, do. And here's another uh, convenience uh, convenience function for uh, for Nylearn, where we can just take the the mean of an image. So this is a four dimensional four dimensional matrix, and this just uh, is just a, a shorthand way of taking a mean of uh, each voxel over uh, over time. So we now have access to the uh, to the mean bold image and plotting the view stack command I think a majority of these are uh, interactive so you can click around and see where the uh, and look at your bold image data just through the the Jupyter notebook and there are some other uh, there are some other convenience uh, functions where we can resample data. So resampling means we want to make the, we don't want to actually reposition the image. We just want to, uh, we could consider this just reslicing, changing the voxel sizes, or just making so that the, uh, if we had, uh, say like a hundred, a hundred numbers in this, uh, in this Y plane, we now want that to be 50 numbers. So then we need to uh, either just take the average of each of the, the two numbers that were in the, uh, the 100 box matrix in order to make it so that it's just 50 long instead of 100 long, or some other type of more advanced resampling than that. Um, or not necessarily more advanced, but just a little bit more intelligent. OK. So we can see that the uh, the shape of the the mean data matrix that we made is 
uh, 64 by 64 by 30 and that but the the t1 image that we have loaded it has many more uh, has many more numbers than that so we can resample uh, in this case the the first thing is the is the image that we want to resample and the uh, the target that we want to resample the image 2 is going to be the the mean bold image <laughs> and then we can look at the um, look at both the original T1 and the resampled T1, just so we can um, look at how the T1 image looks like if the voxels were sliced to be the same size as the uh, as the bold voxels. So, and this will be useful to. Uh, I guess do a one-to-one -one comparison for saying if we classified a particular region in the in the T1 uh, in the T1 image to be say like the hippocampus, then we wanted to overlay it on the on the bold image to see like where is the what is the average activation in the uh, of the hippocampus in the in the bold data using uh, using some type of matching in our T1 data. We'd probably also want to do some uh, rotation of the T1 image as well, but uh, re-slicing is the, is the, is one, is, will be an essential step in order to get that done. Then here, uh, Nylern also has a, a smoothing function, so we can uh, smooth images. Smoothing is often, uh, is commonly done in order to uh, try to increase the signal to noise ratio of our data, in order to, uh, if the signal's true, then it should be uh, kind of condensed within a, a particular area. But if it's uh, mostly noise, then the smoothing should help uh, smooth out the smooth out the noise while enhancing the signal. So we can see um, what different smoothing kernel sizes has on the data. We can see the data gets blurrier as we smooth it more, as we would expect. And uh, we can do a little bit more of the actual filtering functions and getting through uh, regressing out like confounds from, uh, from, uh, from our data so that we can take into account different uh, different uh, traditional uh, sources of, of noise. So with here, we can just simply uh, detrend our data, which will give it, uh, a, which I want to say does a, what did I say, a low pass filter and demeans the data. Then we'll see what do, what standardized does. So uh, detrend and standardize makes the uh, normalizes the variance so that the yes relative to the just detrended it the the variance is a lot lower. And that's true. Do, 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 do. And then with the confounds that we have here, we have uh, we just specified this uh, par file, so we can take a look and see what's in the contents of this uh, dot par file, which is just a, a movement file that uh, should be recording the. There we go. And it should just be a number, uh, a series of columns that specify uh, where each row corresponds to a particular volume in the the, the bold acquisition. So we can use this uh, just these lists of numbers as confounds inside the the clean image command. So now we can see that we have uh, been able to pre-process our uh, Pre-process our data and make it uh, and take into account certain arbitrary confounds. And if you use a tool like fMRI prep, 
uh, fmi prep outputs uh, columns of data that are uh, like this so that you can uh, easily easily plug those into the uh, the clean image command as well <laughs> all right so I think with with that let's see if there's uh, something else that we really need to cover all right now I want to uh, open this up to uh, to questions to cover what you want to cover since some of this is stuff that you can just kind of run through on your own time and just figure figure it out and I think that I've given uh, I don't want to make you sit here forever just listening to me talk uh, so I'm gonna open it up for questions for a few minutes just to kind of get an idea of like what can or can't you do with uh, with Nylearn and then uh, I can set you free or answer additional questions offline. So are there uh, are there questions about what we what about the material that we've covered or uh, or I guess what are your questions about the material that we covered or what Nylearn or Nylearn cannot do? Well just to kind of a big picture question. Yeah. Here, um, I know you pick very specific examples, but almost every example that you showed has apne has something that that exists already. Mm -hmm. um, if I didn't already know apne, I would probably want to use this. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there are other tools that exist within my and I babble that apne doesn't have. Um, mm -hmm. Well, if somebody already knows how to manipulate data using Apni, how to get, how to smooth the data, detrend the data, do 3D info to look at image orientation, mm -hmm. um, is there much reason to consider moving to this uh, environment? Yeah, so I'm just going to repeat your question. So uh, in summary, I would say if a person already knows about one of these other software packages that does uh, a lot of these things that Nylon does, like smoothing and detrending and uh, all these other features, why would we uh, want to use Nylon instead? Um, and one reason that we would uh, want to use Nylearn as opposed to these other things if we uh, are dedicated to just using one tool to get everything done. Um, so independent, uh, let's say we, if we didn't have Docker, then uh, to get this, to get uh, our processing pipeline to work, then we would just be working in Python, then we'd know that uh, we don't need to install uh, multiple different things. And now, instead of having to keep track of, say, both AFNI and Python, we just need to keep track of Python. Or if we throw FSL into the mix, now we don't need to keep track of AFNI, FSL, and, uh, and Python. So it's just trying to, I guess, in a certain sense, yeah, there is a... You've already spent some time, or you've already invested time to learn uh, AFNI or FSL, these other software packages. So uh, why dedicate even more time to learn uh, Nylearn <laughs> to do these things? And uh, I agree. And I the other uh, and the other solution to that um, to I guess keep keep FSL and AFNI commands, but use it within a, uh, a Python framework would be the NiPipe that uh, I've talked about before. And yeah, so the reason for it is that it makes it uh, simpler for someone that's jumping in just to worry about one piece of software instead of worrying about like a, uh, a larger tech stack that they need to uh, be aware of. Uh, for people and for uh, yeah, just getting stuff installed and just getting uh, off to the off the ground running. Um, some departments like psychiatry, like you already have like a an environment that's kind of set out for you. But for some other people, 
uh, in other lab spaces, like installing FSL and AFNI is uh, going to be a process in of itself and just trying to get people started up. And that can be like a major uh, roadblock that makes it hard to get started. And I guess and, and Docker also makes that easier. So if you like picked up a Docker singularity solution, then you could set it up so that you already have, uh, or if you have a, uh, an IT person, like uh, Jason is kind of like your Docker he just manages the uh, manages the software stack and makes sure that everything is working. So Docker is just like a, a more automated way of doing that. Um, so you could just have uh, FSL and AFNI and all your other uh, neuroimaging specific software packages set up to be installed and then ship that to, well, and then everybody else can have that exact same environment. I yeah. Like Mm -hmm. screens. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that would be possible to, would, you, would it be possible to interface FSL or AFNI with Jupyter Notebooks to then see the output in the same way as you just showed with the Mallory stuff? So, yeah, the question is, is if we can integrate uh, the output of FSL and AFNI with uh, Jupyter Notebook. The answer is kind of. Um, so it'll just require a little bit more. Uh, I guess I would have to look into what the development team is doing with, like, say, uh, Fossilize or uh, their innate viewers in order to, say, get the same type of interactive viewing experience within Jupyter Notebooks. I don't know if they have made anything to make it integrate like that. But uh, And for other things that, say, output uh, images or nifty files, I mean, you can run the FSL command either through Nightpipe or you can call it with the uh, making the the command a bash command with the uh, with the with the bang sign here inside a Jupyter notebook, and you can create a, call an FSL command to create a new image, and then you'd still have to yeah go through the intermediary step of loading it in with Nightbabel and then showing the image result of where the FSL command outputs. So. Not quite direct, but it's possible. Uh, and you can still, the end result will still be the same where you have the, uh, the data and the, or the FSL command and the output from the FSL command inside a, some type of visualization. But you still have to go through like the intermediary of uh, NiBabel or NiLearn to get that. But yeah, uh, the, the documentation for the websites is uh, is linked in the I think in the first notebook. Yeah, for NiBabel and NiLearn, they offer very comprehensive documentation uh, for for doing for. I guess if you're interested in starting like doing more things, the NiLearn documentation might be a little bit better. NiBabel has great documentation uh, since I uh, brushed over that. Uh, how we deal with orientation and spacing. NiBabel has great explanations of uh, how we represent our uh, how we represent our data, like in scanner space versus as we load it in as a matrix. So, if you want more explanation on that, that uh, NiBabel is an excellent resource. And then NiLearn is uh, yeah, you know, they have lots of uh, community examples where you can run through uh, different different aspects of their functionality. I think part of their uh, part of their development philosophy is that for every new functionality added, they, you have to add an example using that functionality. So they uh, they are they're fairly well annotated with uh, examples. So you can kind of pick things and learn things as you as you want. Okay. Uh, are there other questions? Or comments, or yeah, anything really. <laughs> so, can we um, integrate to the MRI QC and um, like um, the other like, scripts as well, or uh, integrate the Jupyter notebook, or uh, no, the, the 
that I learned on yeah, so what, uh, yeah, what a common, uh, what a processing pipeline that uh, I've done is the output of fMRI prep. Mm -hmm. I can load into uh, a Jupyter notebook mm -hmm. and then load those files in and have a, uh, and be able to use the, the confounds file that fMRI prep outputs and use those as a, my, uh, I use, use those as my confounds to clean the signal. And then I've uh, done things as uh, what I mentioned near the beginning was just doing like a straight up symmetrical correlation between uh, I have all these different regions I'm interested in and getting the uh, extracting the signal from. And then I can just correlate those uh, signals with each other inside NILEARN. And yeah, then I can output a uh, nice symmetrical matrix or do other uh, manipulations on that on that yeah, uh, correlation post matrix. Processing types of post processing types of work can be also done in NILEARN. Yeah. 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 Yeah
uh, the variability between the, the data sets that I'm reading in. So yeah, so once that complexity starts getting introduced into the Python file, it becomes uh, the, the differences between the two can start to diverge because you might need to change your strategy for the actual Python file as you did for the example. So, and I haven't, mm, yeah, and I don't have a, uh, a great solution for that right now. It's one of the, it's one of the negatives <laughs> that I have about the, my current workflow for that. All right. I think with that, I am going to shut off the recording and uh, well, I'll be able to tackle some other questions and other people want to get installed and running uh, offline. All right. Thanks for, for watching if you're online and happy hacking.